everything that we've talked about so far has been using mostly uranium-235 as the fuel. And so uranium-235 is uh, a naturally occurring isotope of uranium, but it's only about half a percent of the uranium on the planet. So most uranium is uranium-238, and then you have uranium-235, which is, uh, I'm sorry, 235 instead of 250, 235, uh, where you have to enrich the fuel in uranium-235 in order to get it to operate. So you have to basically increase the amount of uranium-235 by about a factor of five to get it to where you would put it into a commercial reactor. So that's a that's part of the expense of nuclear energy is enriching the uranium up to three to five percent uranium-235. But this is the reason that we have to enrich in uranium-235 comes down to the neutron or the fission cross-section. So the probability of absorbing a neutron and then having a fission event take place. And so I will pull up a graphic of the neutron. Let's see, the fission cross-section. And this shows why we use, why we use uranium-235. Okay, so this is the fission cross-section as opposed to just the absorption cross-section. Those are not the same thing. So the fission, the total cross-section is the sum of all the things that can happen after you absorb something. The fission cross-section is um, the probability of absorbing something and then having a fission event happen afterwards. Let's see, question, what is it they refer to as weapons grade? Uh, weapons grade plutonium is, or weapons grade uranium is more like 90, 80 to 90%. Uh, that's probably something worth looking up. So let's look up weapons grade. Uh, just so that, you know, I can correct the record if I've said anything that's wrong. Uh, typically 93% plutonium-239, weapons-grade nuclear material. Uh, yeah, so in order to get weapons-grade material, they do it the same way, they just have to take it further. So my suspicion is that it's like 90%. Does it say? Oh, look at all these things. Critical mass in kilograms. It's a critical mass once you've arrived at some density. Uh, the shape with minimum critical mass has the smallest physical dimensions as a sphere. Bare sphere critical mass at normal density of some actinides are listed in the accompanying table. Most information on bare sphere masses is classified. I wonder why, uh, but some documents have been declassified. So I suspect, is this like 100% pure? It doesn't necessarily say. Any weapons-grade nuclear material must have a critical mass that is small enough to justify its use in a weapon. Critical mass for any material is the smallest amount needed for a sustained nuclear chain reaction. Uh, that is, of course, infinite for any material that is not radioactive. However, different isotopes have different critical masses, and the critical mass for many radioactive isotopes is infinite because the mode of decay of one atom cannot induce a similar decay of more than one neighboring atom. The critical mass of uranium-238 is infinite, while the critical masses of uranium-233 and uranium-235 are finite. Weapons-grade nuclear material is fissionable material that is pure enough to make a nuclear weapon or has properties to, that make it particularly suitable for nuclear weapons use. Uh, plutonium and uranium in grades normally used in nuclear weapons are the most common examples, but there are other ones as shown here. As you can see, the half-life is kind of smaller. The critical mass in kilograms is listed there. You'll notice that most of these are odd-numbered isotopes, and this is something I've mentioned before. So uranium-233, uranium-235, neptunium-237. Neptunium already has an odd number of protons, and so this neptunium-236, um, you know, it's, it's a slightly different animal because it's got an odd number of protons, where uranium and plutonium have even numbers of protons. Countries that have produced weapons-grade material are these ones. Does it have a 90%? Okay, highly enriched uranium is considered weapons grade when it has been enriched to about 90% U-235. So that's what, I, that's what I said before. Okay, here are some questions. Do they know what causes an atom to decay? Like what inputs cause it to decay? Um, so it's kind of the same, well, it depends on what the decay is. But yes, it, fundamentally all of these nuclear decays come from the weak nuclear force. Um, in the... Well, the beta decays come from the weak nuclear force, and it's just a matter of what is the most energetic, energetically favorable mixture of protons and neutrons with a given number of uh, nucleons. So let's say that you have some substance with 100 nucleons in it. Um, you could have one proton and 100 neutrons, so you have hydrogen with 100 neutrons around it, and nature would say that's not energetically favorable, and so I'm going to cause some of these 
uh, neutrons to spontaneously decay into protons through beta emission. And then it will settle down into whatever causes the nucleus to be most tightly bound. Um, and th it's basically the same kind of thing with uh, alpha emission, where it's how do I get the nucleus more tightly bound? What avenues are available to me to cause the nucleus to contract and to increase the strength in the fields, like the, the strong nuclear force, and release energy along the way. Let us take a look again at this. This is the fission cross-section. The fission cross-section for different brands of plutonium. Wow, well, there's a lot of different plutonium brands in here, and uranium-235 and uranium-238. Uranium-235 and 238 are going to be what? The blue and the, looks like red. Okay, so blue up here at the top. Is it blue or purple? Wow, what a, what a color scheme. What an amazing color scheme we use here. I believe it's going to be this purple is uranium-235. So here's uranium-235. We know that it has a low absorption or low fission cross-section for high energy uh, neutrons that come in. And that's why you have a moderator to slow the neutrons down and you increase the absorption cross-section by about a factor of 100. So you cool them down um, until you're in this area and the fission cross-section goes up, and that's what allows you to sustain, sustain the reactor. And the thing that causes a reaction to be sustainable is whether you have enough neutrons around to compensate for the low absorption cross-section. So you, you have something, it's got some probability of absorbing and fissioning, so I, I should have said the low fission cross-section, uh, absorbing a neutron and then breaking apart. And if uh, that probability is fairly small, right? It's measured in barns, which is, even though it's an homage to the broadside of a barn, it's a tiny number. And so the more neutrons you have around, the more likely you are going to be to have one of these fission events take place. So by increasing the number of neutrons available to you, you can increase the reaction that's taking place. One of the problems that you have with a moderator, uh, especially using water as a moderator, is that there are multiple isotopes of water that are around. So if you're talking about elastic collisions between a neutron that comes out, so here's your fission event that takes place, here's a neutron that comes out, that neutron's gonna come and bounce around bumping into things, and that will slow it down. The more similar the mass of the neutron is to the mass of the particle that you're bumping into, the quicker it will thermalize. Uh, the quicker its kinetic energy will be shared among the different particles. And so the best, one of the best particles you could use would be a proton, and that means hydrogen. So you have a neutron coming around and it can bounce off of this proton and it will impart some of its kinetic energy to the proton and remove some of the kinetic energy from the neutron. One of the challenges that you run into is that there's a stable isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, deuterium like this, where you have a proton and you have a neutron. And so these neutrons, some fraction of the neutrons can be absorbed onto the protons and that removes these neutrons from the environment and therefore reduces the uh, your ability to sustain the nuclear chain reaction. Okay, so it's not going to be every interaction that happens. It's going to be some fraction of the time. But any way that you bleed neutrons out of the system or remove neutrons from the system is going to slow your reactor down. And so if you have a, a cross section, a fission cross section that is too low, the presence you know, if you're using water as a moderator, the presence of that hydrogen can make it so that you can't sustain the reaction at all. So one of the solutions to this was proposed or is used in some Canadian reactors, including the reactor that is shown right here. It's a can-do reactor. Uh, can is for Canadian. Uh, um, there are probably some other things that those letters stand for. And this one actually uses heavy water. So the can-do reactor already, uh, the water already has deuterium in place of some of the hydrogen. So it's not that every water molecule is going to have two deuteriums, but what you probably have is HDO, where it's you're, you have an oxygen atom here, you have a deuterium atom here, and then you have a hydrogen. This is most this is more common than the other. Uh, the no, amount, the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen, so the deuterium to hydrogen ratio is about 10 to the minus 5, which means that for every 100,000 hydrogen atoms, you have one deuterium atom. And this is uh, this has been the way since the beginning of the universe. So all the deuterium that we have was created in the first three minutes of the universe's lifetime. So 
uh, it's not rare. One part in 10 to the 5 is fairly common, but you do have to extract it, right? You have to be able to separate the regular water from the heavy water. So that means that it's only going to be one in every 10 billion, one in every 10 to the 10 water molecules that actually has two deuteriums, that's D2O, uh, where it's actually D2O. Oftentimes you'll see D2O, and what they're actually referring to is one hydrogen, one deuterium, and the oxygen. When you have these CANDU reactors, they're using heavy water, so you have um, these deuteriums in there, and therefore they've already absorbed the neutron. They already have the neutron there, and so when you have the neutron coming from the reactor core, it won't be absorbed, and so that increases the amount of neutrons that are available to be absorbed by some amount. So all of, you know, at least half of the neutrons that would have been absorbed by this water, uh, by the protons in this water, have already got their neutron with it. Um, I, did I say did I say that right? Half of the protons that would absorb a neutron from the reactor environment already have the neutron that they would have absorbed, and therefore you increase the number of neutrons in the in the reactor, and you're able to do a few things. One of them is you're able to uh, operate um, using different fuel. These are uh, the fission cross section for uranium-235. Notice, however, that uranium-238, so that's the red one, uranium-238 has a lower uh, fission cross section. Okay. However, at high speeds, at high energies, the fission cross-section of uranium-238 is comparable to the fission cross-section of uranium-235. So they're all up here. And this is also the point of, it's not equal to, it still has a lower fission cross-section, but the cross-section is not, what, a million times lower. So the fact that you can have uranium-238 around, um, if you have more uh, neutrons available to you, then you can use uranium-238 as your nuclear fuel. Notice that the absorption cross-section at high energy, it's lower, but it's not lower by a huge amount. It's lower by maybe a factor of 10 in this area, right? So this is a factor of 100. One of these tick marks is a factor of 100, so half of that's a factor of 10. And so the probability of, absor of fissioning from a neutron is lower, but if you increase the number of neutrons, then you can compensate for the fact that it's lower. And that allows you to operate with unenriched fuel. So you have uh, some unenriched, you have some amount of uranium-235 around that fissions really easily, and then you have mostly uranium-238, but you can get fission happening uh, in the uranium-238 because you have fewer neutrons being absorbed by your moderator. And that was the point of the CANDU reactors, like, hey, let's design a reactor where we do a bunch of processing up front, so they process the, uh, the water so that they can get the heavy water out, and then we can just run regular uranium through it, and we don't have to worry about constantly reprocessing the fuel. We can just go get the uranium ore and then stick it in the reactor. So that is the CANDU reactor. When you have a reactor that operates at with high energy, then it's called a fast reactor. Fast reactor. A react. C reactor. And that's an O. Fast reactor. Okay, and I don't know about cannot do reactors. So the can do reactors, that's all we care about is being able to do something. So a fast reactor uses regular neutrons. It doesn't worry so much about thermalizing the neutrons, bringing them down to uh, slower speeds. It uses the neutrons um, as they operate more. It, it uses the neutrons when they directly come out of the interaction. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of the things that's common, let me take a look really quickly about the, um, the neutron absorption cross-section. Not what I meant to do, here we go. Neutron absorption cross-section of uranium. All right, so the capture cross-section is what we're looking at here. So the neutrons produced by fission are high energy neutrons. And the capture cross-section, you'll notice here, the capture cross-section is lower by a factor of 10, right? Here's a factor of 10 here. This is a little bit more than a factor of 10, to be honest, because this is both a log scale. Um, but the uranium-238 capture cross-section is fairly high. Um, the fission cross-section for uranium-238 was way down here, okay, uh, way, way down here. And then it comes up 
um, for fission with fast neutrons. However, the capture cross section is higher here. And what does it happens when you capture uranium-238 or you capture a neutron under uranium-238? It doesn't break apart, but it goes through a few radioactive decays and turns into plutonium-239. So this is um, one of the types of fast reactors is called a fast breeder reactor. So I'll put this in here, breeder reactor. And what you do there is you take uranium-238, you add the neutron to it, you wait around for a bit because it does have to go through some decays. And what you end with is uranium, I'm sorry, not uranium, you end up with plutonium-239. So you breed uranium-238 and turn it into plutonium-239. You have to go through a stage, I think, is it neptunium? Uranium, neptunium, and then plutonium. So the uranium-238 will turn into neptunium-239, which will then decay um, through a, what looks like... Well, and then it, you go through two sets of decays to go from uranium-238 to neptunium-239 when you absorb the neutron to plutonium-239. And then this is your fuel. So with a breeder reactor, if we go back to the fission cross-section, uh, this one, plutonium-239 is yellow. And yellow, you'll notice, you can hardly see it on here, but it's there. Yellow is almost exactly the same neutron absorption cross-section as uranium-235. So you start with uranium-238. You absorb these fast neutrons because you have more of them around. Those turn uh, the uranium, after some steps, into plutonium-239, which behaves similar to uranium-235. So you're basically creating a different nuclear fuel by breeding um, not a very good nuclear fuel and turning it into a good nuclear fuel through this breeding process. So this is going to be important when we talk about the generation four reactors, especially the thorium reactors, which is what we're going to be going into, because thorium reactors work the same way. So when you hear all these things about all oh, thorium is going to be the greatest um, technology in the world, which I think is um, probably true. It's going to be uh, great once these things get working. China's already building some thorium reactors. Um, those are going to operate the same way uh, as these ones, where you're starting with something, you're breeding it into your nuclear fuel, and then you're using the nuclear fuel after that process. Okay, so this is, when you hear the phrase fast reactor, it is talking about using fast neutrons. And typically what's happening, you know, d depends on the type of moderator, but typically what's happening here is you're using the fast neutrons to breed uranium-238 into plutonium-239, and then you're using that as your fuel. Okay, so there are a few questions in here. One of them is uh, plutonium-239 is a weapons material. That's true. Plutonium-239 is a weapons material, but so is uranium-235. Excuse me. So uranium-235 is a weapons material, plutonium-239 is weapons material, but in order to get them to be weapons, they have to be enriched and isolated up to the point where you can get the sustained reaction without the presence of a moderator. And so in order to get if you have these things and you're getting plutonium-239, it's really not a whole lot different than getting the uranium-235, right? There's some big industrial process that it takes to get the plutonium-239 um, compared to getting the uranium-235. The main difference is that once you generate the plutonium-239, so let's go back into how you enrich the uranium to begin with. So this is a concern that um, people have about nuclear nonproliferation. We don't want to have nuclear weapons in the hands of just any, you know, Joe Schmo on the corner. Um, I know that in 1985, the plutonium might be available in every corner drugstore, but in 1955, it's a little hard to come by. So in, uh, to enrich uranium-235, you have all these centrifuges and you're piping one thing into it, like down a series of centrifuges. So these are all centrifuges and you're enriching it uh, one step at a time because you have to physically separate uranium-235 from uranium-238 from uranium uh, because they have the same chemistry. The difference is when you go to plutonium, so now you have plutonium, you can separate the plutonium chemically from the uranium because it's got different number of electrons and so it has different bonding properties. You know, it bonds to a different number of things. So chemical separation is much easier than physical separation. So if you want to make a bomb out of uranium, you have a simple process but laborious process to go from one uh, to the next to the next to the next and eventually you get uranium-235 enriched to the point where you can make a weapon out of it. If you want to make a plutonium, what you do is you build a plant. So here's your plant and you breed the plutonium-239 from the uranium-238 and then you chemically separate them. And so the, 
this is the laborious step is making that that reactor that allows you to generate the plutonium and then you have this added step of um, chemically separating them so this one is easier this one is more challenging as opposed to the uranium enrichment where this one is uh, the challenging part like the expensive part and but the process is easy so this is always going to be an issue um, with any of these kinds of things but that's uh, kind of the way that that works so it's always going to be like either this is expensive or just that's expensive this one's actually cheaper it just takes longer and this one is more expensive um, and takes a higher degree of technical expertise to execute so back to this idea of a breeder reactor let me, let me show you a slide that i have it's an amazing slide okay so this is a, a bit of background on these different nuclear fuels so what we have here is thorium on this line we have protactinium on this line, and then uranium here and then neptunium and plutonium and what's shown on this is different isotopes of uranium different isotopes of thorium different isotopes of you know fill in your uh, favorite element the ones that are in red so the three that are listed in red those are good nuclear fuels so they're good materials to have in a nuclear reactor if you want to have a sustained chain reaction uh, i already mentioned that they're all odd numbers we have two that are uranium isotopes we have one that is a plutonium isotope now the stuff that is circled in blue the stuff are, are squared the stuff with the blue boundaries these are things that are naturally occurring so there's naturally occurring uranium-235 not very much but there is some and there's a lot of naturally occurring uranium-238 this is 99.5% is uranium-238 0.5% uranium-235 and thorium is actually more abundant than uranium so there's more thorium in the earth's crust certainly in the united states there's more thorium than there is uranium okay so these are the three naturally occurring isotopes up at this part of the periodic table and green are uh hold on what what is going on here get away, go away go away the green things these are what are called fertile materials meaning that you can take them and turn them into fissile materials so the fissile materials are the ones in red those are the, your nuclear fuels the fertile materials are the ones in green they're not fissile you don't make a reactor out of them unless you do some intermediate stage to turn them into something else and that's where this breeder reactor comes in so you start with uranium-238 you can breed it by adding these neutrons and it will become uranium-239 which will decay twice into uh, neptunium-239 and then plutonium-239 and then this is your fuel so you breed it from here up to there the same thing would happen in a thorium reactor so a thorium reactor will take thorium-232 which is basically the only stable isotope so 99.99999 percent of the thorium on the earth is thorium-232 and uh, you would do the same process that you do with uranium with thorium where you add a neutron and then you allow it to decay over time to turn into uranium-233 and uranium-233 is your nuclear fuel when you have a thorium reactor you're actually using uranium-233 as your fuel and thorium is your it's your fertile material and then your fissile material is the stuff that you breed it to so same thing happens with the Kandu reactors you're going to start with uranium you're going to be producing the plutonium and it's the plutonium that's going to be um, powering the reactor so breeder reactors do this step now one of the things that you have with uh, uranium this uranium fuel uranium to plutonium is that neptunium 239 has a relatively short half-life on the other hand protactinium 233 which is the intermediate step for the thorium breeder reactor protactinium 233 has a longer half-life i think this is like 50 days or something like that and so when you create the thorium 233 and then it decays into protactinium 233 you have to wait around for a month for this protactinium to turn into the uranium 233 so somehow you have to store this protactinium um, for this amount of time before it gets used in the what's ultimately a uranium fuel cycle where the neptunium has a much shorter half-life and so it very quickly goes from the uranium-238 through this process to turn into plutonium-239 so this is one of the technical challenges that you face when you make a thorium reactor is the fact that protactinium lives for a long time and so you have to like what do you do with it if it's sitting in your reactor then it can just get in the way of things um, so that's a challenge this is the landscape of available naturally occurring nuclear fuels 
is that you can either start with uranium-235 or that you can breed up from these other isotopes. Now, the way that um, the thorium reactor works, so I guess we'll go into how the, the proposed thorium reactors that are being used are called molten salt, molten salt thorium reactor, MSTR. Okay, and what they do there is, and you don't have to do it with thorium, you can actually do it with uranium as well. So I guess we'll just talk about molten salt reactors in general. So molten salt. A salt is something where you take um, you know, sodium, you have a metal, and chlorine, and you combine these two things together and you get this ionic bond that forms between the two. And it's very stable, right? You're, you're able to, you wouldn't want to have chlorine gas just wafting around your house. You also wouldn't want to have just bare sodium um, sitting on your countertop or something like that. This is an explosive metal um, and this is a poisonous gas. However, when you mix them together, they come totally inert, just stable. You can put it on your table, you can put it in your mouth, you can eat it. Um, it's makes your food taste even more deliciouser than it would otherwise. And so having something in a salt, it's a nice stable compound. It also has a fairly high melting point. So t table salt has a melting point. I don't recall the exact number, but it's something like 500 degrees Celsius. Um, might be 400 Celsius or something like that. Uh, maybe it's 500 Kelvin. Uh, anyways, it's several hundred degrees. So don't quote me on this. You can It's something to look up in a table. So the idea that uh, with a molten salt reactor is goes back to some of the safety issues that you have with the boiling and pressurized water reactor. And that specifically is that you have a phase change with the water reactors. So if you're working with water, you have a phase change from a liquid to a gas at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, And if you pressurize it, then you can get this maybe up to 300 degrees Celsius. And you're always worried uh, about this turning from a liquid to a gas because when it turns into a gas then the volume expands and when the volume expands the pressure goes way 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 up and that's where you can rupture things and you have that phase transition is a huge difference in the physical state of the system going from the liquid to a gas with a salt however you have you know say like sodium chloride let's pretend for the moment that i was right and that it's around 500 degrees celsius is the melting point so it, it's solid up until this point but then it stays as a liquid uh clear up to like well like 1800 degrees or something like that it's got a huge range of temperatures where it remains as a liquid so it doesn't boil for um till much higher temperatures where water boils you know it's only got 100 degrees it's got from zero to 100 um, under ambient pressure, you have a 100 degree window to operate with water in a liquid state. Where with the salt, it will stay in a liquid state for over a thousand degrees. So that's a much, there's a lot more wiggle room in your reactor or in your environment if you stay, if you're using these molten salts. So they're clear, uh, they turn into transparent liquid, they, they have this wide range of temperatures, and one of the benefits you have is that when you're operating at high temperatures, there are a couple of benefits that come from this. The first benefit is that when you're operating at higher temperatures, your efficiency goes up because the efficiency that you get from any uh, heat engine is going to be related to, it's one minus the temperature of the cold divided by the temperature of the hot. You can't change the temperature of the cold environment because that's just ambient temperature outside, like room temperature. Uh, but the temperature of the hot one, you can control. So as you increase the temperature of the hot part of your cycle, this it drives this fraction closer to zero and raises your efficiency up considerably. So if you go from like 300 degrees Celsius to let's say that you're operating at 600 degrees Celsius, uh, what does that mean? You have to measure the temperature in Kelvin. So 300 Celsius is about 500 Kelvin. 600 Celsius, I want to make this a thousand. So let's pretend that you're going at up to 800 degrees Celsius. So you operate at 800 Celsius, which puts you at a thousand Kelvin. Okay, so with a pressurized water reactor, you might be at 500 Kelvin. But if you're using a molten salt and the temperatures where you have a molten salt, then you could be operating up near a thousand Kelvin. And so that gives you a factor of two improvement in this term. It cuts that fraction in half, which increases uh, the efficiency that you get. So if you start with an efficiency for a pressurized water reactor of like 33%, then you can in principle uh, approach an efficiency that's closer to 60%, you know, 66% if you double the temperature of the hot environment. So the efficiency goes way up. You don't get quite this uh, gain, but around 50% is 
uh, going up to about 50% is a huge difference. That would be like almost doubling the capacity of the um, electricity in the grid simply by being more efficient, by not wasting as much energy. You can use more energy, um, you can extract more energy from a hot environment. And so imagine using the same amount of uh, fuel except that you get twice as much electricity out of it simply out of the efficiency improvement that you get. So here is a comment, uh, melt at 800 Celsius, gas at 1413. So um, that so that's for, uh, okay, melt at 800 and then gas at 1400 Celsius. That's for sodium chloride. Now what you'll actually use instead of sodium chloride in a reactor is you'll use something like um, thorium Cl Cl6 or something like that. It's going to be some really complicated or much more complicated molecule. And they're going to use a variety of different salts depending upon the neutron absorption properties of the different materials that go into this. And so, for example, FLIBE energy, F-L-I-B-E, um, I think this is a capital B, and I think that's a capital L. So FLIBE energy is fluorine, lithium, beryllium salt. So you have thorium, and then you're adding a mixture of fluorine, uh, lithium and beryllium to make your salt and so in whatever combination that happens to be so these salts aren't going to be just sodium chloride but the basic idea so this would be a thorium fluoride salt with these other additives in it um, you can also imagine making the same thing with uranium fluoride um, you can do uranium chloride um, and then you'd have just different amounts of the stoichiometry would be different depending upon you know a whole bunch of things so these are uh, the different elements that you would use and what you want to use in your reactor depends upon some of the details of your reactor design and so it, it'd be a little boring to go into well if you use chlorine and fluorine in some mixture then you're going to get this other property that you can engineer around like these are all details that are useful to some people but you know not for the general population just the idea that it's going to be similar to um, the, effectively like a table salt okay you have this wide range in temperature and a benefit of that wide range in temperature for these salts you know you say you go from 400 celsius up to a thousand celsius or 1500 celsius as your temperature range is you don't have to worry about it turning into a gas you don't have to worry about your material your liquid um, all of a sudden vaporizing and then rate increasing the pressure so instead of building a building that looks like this, where you have a huge concrete wall, so here's your huge concrete wall, and you put your reactor core in here, and your reactor core has 8,000 bolts going around it um, so that you can keep the pressure high in the reactor core. And if the reactor core uh, melts down and therefore it causes all this stuff to evaporate, you have to contain it in a large containment building. You can build one of these thorium reactors and just put it in a box, put it in a shipping container because it's not operating under high pressure. And so you don't run the risk of releasing all this gas and causing, you know, kind of a, a big explosion like you would get from having a, a pressure cooker that ruptures all of a sudden. So there's no need for the big containment building on the outside because uh, there's, no, there's no change in phase that's anticipated. In fact, there's no material, you wouldn't be able to operate the, the reactor at 1500 degrees, it's, um, it's too hot. Like, you'd melt through all of your, um, it, it would cause wearing in your materials so that they wouldn't last very long. So you would be operating at a much lower temperature than the highest temperature that's available to you. Unlike with water, where the water's already gonna be steam and so you have to maintain that high pressure. With the molten salt reactors, what you would typically have is you have a reactor core, looks like this, okay, you have your fuel rod, uh, not your fuel rods, you have a set of control rods. You have like a lattice of control rods. Um, uh, hold on a second, that's not what I meant to say. You have a lattice of moderators. So here, the rods are, the structure that's in here is the moderators. So typically, you'll have graphite moderators now. So these are carbon moderators. You'll still, um, you can still put control rods in here to um, cut down on the neutrons that become moderated. and But the moderators themselves are just this structure that's floating inside of this big vat filled with the liquid uh, fuel. Then what happens is the liquid fuel will circulate because you know it boils basically. Um, 
it's well, it's not boiling. It's but it is circulating through convection. So hot stuff is rising, uh, cold stuff is sinking, and so it circulates through these control rods. Not the control rod. It circulates through the moderator that's kind of built um, rigidly within this system. Uh, as opposed to what happens with the pressurized water reactor, the pressurized water reactor, you have rigid fuel rods and you circulate the moderator through the fuel rods. Here you have a rigid moderator and you're circulating the fuel through the rigid, um, the liquid fuel through the moderator. So it comes in um, and then you get the reaction taking place inside here. You start with thorium, start with thorium 232. Uh, it comes uh, as it comes into the moderator, it picks up some neutrons that eventually breeds it from 232 up through a few stages until you get to uranium 2, I'm sorry, uranium, uranium 233. And then this is the thing that breaks apart and causes the fission reaction to, to take place. So you're in, there is your reaction is with uranium 233. What you can do with the liquid fuel is you can then have a loop out here. You siphon off the material that's inside your chamber. You run it through a small processing plant and then cycle it, siphon it back, or like squirt it back into your reactor. And this little processing plant, what you'll do is you can chemically separate the byproducts of this. So when you have a solid fuel, uh, here is a solid fuel. Here's a solid fuel pellet. It has all these decays that take place. And so when you cut the solid fuel pellet open, you're gonna have individual atoms of the fission products. So you're gonna have two things. One, you're gonna have fission products. So that's gonna be fission products with the P. So that's going to be all of those um, intermediate half-life things that we talked about, the iodine and strontium and xenon and stuff like that. And you're also going to have your transuranics. Trans, transuranics. Your actinides. And these are the things that are the really long half-life, um, 10,000, 100,000 year half-life things. So this is the stuff that is harder to deal with. This is the stuff that's easier to deal with. All of these things you can use if you could separate them. But when you have solid fuel, they're embedded in the fuel. You have all these things that are just inside the fuel pellet in a solid form. When you have the liquid fuel, then all of these fission products and the transuranics and stuff like that are gonna be inside the liquid fuel. And so if you can pull the liquid fuel out, you can have a chemical processing plant nearby that goes through and does the chemistry on that liquid fuel and extracts all of these things from it and then feeds it back in. The result is what you get out of here is the waste. Okay. And where what you get from the pellet, this whole thing is the waste. So with solid fuel, the whole pellet is waste and you can't really use it for anything unless you completely dismantle it. Um, you know, crushify the fuel pellet, separate everything out and then re and put it back together, like re-enrich it and put it back together. That's a very expensive process, certainly by the standards of just digging it out of the ground. Okay, because all these things are embedded in this crystal and you have to separate it like that. Here, it's a liquid form. This is still gonna be like 90, um, not 97. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be like 97% uranium-238. So we've, the nuclear fuel, the spent nuclear fuel is mostly just uranium-238 sitting around. Where with this one, you're pulling out the waste and this is basically 100% of the waste, which is only one to 2% of the total mass. So you've immediately, with a liquid fuel, you've immediately re reduced the amount of nuclear waste that you have by almost a factor of 100. Okay, you've gone from 97% to 2%. So it's 1 one hundredth of the mass of nuclear waste that you're producing if you can use a liquid fuel thing because you can reprocess it, you can extract these um, fission products in real time. Another byproduct of having something like this, having a liquid fuel, is that with the solid fuel, you have 97% of the stuff left over um, and it's just not being used for anything. Where here you have this uranium two, I'm sorry, you have this thorium that's in here and you're pulling the thorium out, you're removing, you know, you're, it's the thorium plus all the waste, the iodine and krypton and whatever, comes out, you remove the waste and then the thorium gets put back in and that's your fuel. And so not only do you reduce the waste by almost a factor of 100, but you also improve the amount of fuel that you're using. So instead of using only say 2% of your fuel, 2% of your fuel will get used in solid fuel environment because it's, you start with 3% enrichment. So you have 3% uranium-235 and 97% uranium-238. You go through this process, you get down to 1% uranium-235 at which point you have to pull it out. 
And so you're only using that 2% of your original fuel when you do solid fuel. Here, uh, you do get some stuff from the transuranics as they develop. Uh, some of that gets spent as well. But still, you're only talking about a few percent use. Here, you can get like 90, 99% use of your fuel. So you get less waste, you get a factor of 100 less waste, and you get a factor of 100 improvement in the efficiency with which you can use your fuel. Okay, so that's what, 10,000 times, well, okay, so these are different quantities, but you get an improvement in 100 there, and you get an improvement in almost 100 here as well. So you get higher temperature use, which means that every amount of, all the energy that you produce is produced more efficiently um, because you're operating at higher temperatures. You use your fuel more efficiently, so for the same amount of fuel, you get twice the amount of electricity and times 100 because you're using 100 times as much of the, of the original fuel. Instead of throwing away 97% of the fuel, you're using 99, you know, you're using 97% of the fuel. So you get, if you can get this technology to work, there's huge improvements to be had in terms of the efficiency um, of the fuel use. You know, that's what? That's 10,000 times. You use all the fuel and the fuel burns more efficiently. So it's, it's not 10,000 times. It's about, it's, it's just over 100 times, right? So you get almost 100 times the amount of fuel use. It's more like 50 times the amount of fuel use and you double the efficiency. And so that gets you to, to about 100. So that's pretty gnarly. That's one of the reasons why these things are promising. They're not easy to make. Which otherwise, we would have been using them all along. Um, it does help. Uh, part of the reason that we haven't been using them all along is that there was some political machinations in terms of uh, this person is running for president and they will get jobs in their district if they uh, choose a particular type of technology. And so there were some political things that happened in the early 1970s that um, steered the United States away from the thorium, uh, liquid thorium reactor to the light water reactors that use uranium as fuel. They, both of these reactors were invented by the same guy, the same group of people at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So it's kind of a, unfortunate that that happened because otherwise we would have had, if we would have had a half a century of development in liquid thorium reactors, then well, things would be much different everywhere. So anyways, this has been resurrected. The idea of a liquid thorium reactor has been resurrected and there are some being built. Uh, there are a number being tested and there are a few different um, entities around the world that are developing new designs on these kinds of reactors. Uh, another thing that can happen, you don't have to use thorium for a molten salt reactor. You can use uranium as well. So there are some reactor designs where they're basically just like, send us all your nuclear waste and we will just throw it into a reactor with a bunch of salts and we'll run it through here. So you can use uh, plutonium-239. Um, you can take uh, there are, for example, certain um, reactors that are running, I, I don't know where they are, in the United States where they're basically taking nuclear warheads, the react, like weapons grade plutonium and uranium, and they're just using those in the reactor directly. Uh, you can take uranium-238, uh, 238, you can take um, the nuclear waste, whatever, you can have all sorts of mixtures of these things, and you just put it in this environment with a bunch of neutrons flying around and use up uh, the waste that you get from other reactor sources. So there's an energy, I don't recall, is it Elysium Energy? I think it's called Elysium Energy. Um, I might as well look this one up. Elysium Energy. I think this is the one where they basically take molten chloride salt fast reactor technology to, un so we know, what fast re we know what molten chloride looks like, so that's a salt that's mostly chlorine instead of fluorine. Uh, molten, so it's melted, and it's a fast reactor, which means that it's using um, the neutrons immediately after they come. Uh, the moderator isn't as important. Unlock the abundance of clean, safe, and inexpensive energy for our, glowing, our growing world. And, uh, okay, so it doesn't have a whole lot of information, but I believe that this is the one where they're looking at um, just taking old spent fuel uh, that has a bunch of waste in it and throwing it into here and it can burn basically anything. Um, it can have the fission process running on anything because they have enough neutrons to compensate for the fact that there's a lower uh, fission cross-section. Okay, let's go back to 
another thing that goes along with this discussion about the another advantage of thorium compared to uranium and that will be on this one right here one of the things that you'll notice here is when we have uranium-235 a consequence of the uranium-235 which we saw before let me pull this picture up again so this is the composition of spent nuclear fuel so we saw this graph okay so we saw this graph this graph shows the original composition of your uranium fuel so it's three percent uranium-235 in this case and 97 percent uranium-238 and then over time, you develop all of these <clears throat> um, fission products here, and then the transuranic stuff over here. <coughs> Excuse me. So these transuranics, they develop because um, you have a lot of uranium-238 sitting in the core. So that uranium-238 has some absorption cross-section. Uh, so not all of it breaks apart. Not all of it fissions. In fact, with uranium-238, hardly any of, it, any of it fissions because the fission cross-section is so low. So you start with uranium-238, you have this neutron-rich environment, it's going to absorb some neutrons as it goes. And so you're going to build up plutonium, you're going to build up um, things past plutonium. And so you start adding neutrons to this fuel that's down here, and as you add neutrons to it, you're getting elements that aren't good nuclear fuels. Um, or that don't participate in the fission process. And so that's these things that are developing down here. And you can't really do much with some of this stuff, um, especially in the conditions that are in the reactor, especially with solid fuel where you can't really do much with it. Okay, so you can avoid, or you know, if there was a way to avoid developing some of this stuff, then that also eliminates some of the nuclear waste uh, because this is the most important, or like the most dangerous component of the nuclear waste that we develop are these ones here, the long half-life uh, elements. These ones here have relatively short half-lives. We can deal with them fairly easily. It's these long half-life ones that we have to worry about the most. And so if you start with uranium, 235 that's got that's mixed with uranium 238 so you have these two elements that are in your system uranium 235 is a good nuclear fuel most of it gets spent uranium 238 is going to start developing some of these um, neptunium plutonium 240 and americium 240 it's going to start developing these heavier elements up here that you can't use and so as a consequence there's only if you don't get off at uranium 235 then you're actually going to go into the waste stream if you can't fission at 235, then uh, you're probably going to become waste for the future generations to deal with. If you start with thorium, on the other hand, so you start with thorium-232, you develop, um, you breed it up to uranium-233. Most of the fuel is going to be spent as uranium-233, so like 85% of it's going to fission there. But if you go beyond uranium-233, so say you, instead of having a fission event take place, you just absorb the neutron, so now you're uranium-234. You'll sit around in the reactor, you take the uranium out, you process it, you're like, oh, this is still uranium, I'm going to put it back in. And then you can absorb a second neutron and become uranium-235. And then again here, you're going to have another fission event because this is a good nuclear fuel, like a good fuel for a nuclear reactor. So an advantage you get from a thorium reactor is that you go through two really high quality nuclear fuels um, on your way to producing the waste that is hard to deal with. And so instead of absorb, you know, using 97% of the stuff um, and having 1% make it into the waste stream, you use 97% of the stuff the first time and then 97% of the residual the second time. And so you've gone from 97% to like 99% of the amount of fuel that you spend. You have basically two ways of fissioning the material, which is what you want. Every fission event is the energy that you want, you're looking for without waste producing more in the waste stream. So all of these things um, improve that's all these things are advantages for thorium the disadvantage for thorium is the technical challenge of how do you get from thorium 232 to uranium 233 given the fact that you one are doing it at high temperature so you have to have um, the right kind of materials in your plant and two how do you store it for this amount of time for the protactinium to decay into the uranium 233 okay here are some questions Whoa, lots of questions uh, no Cherenkov radiation. Uh, no, you might get Cherenkov radiation in this one with the electrons that come out. Um, as pure as new fuel, it takes a lot more units of spent fuel to create a single unit of reprocessed fuel. Uh, that's true. So when whenever you reprocess the fuel, you're always going to have less of it um, in the end. And you know that's just the nature of things. Uh, France, I think, has a deliberate 
aspect of it. They factor that into the price. They factor the reprocessing into the price of the electricity. Um, and they have some of the cheapest electricity in Europe as a consequence of the fact that they're using nuclear energy. Um, if I had a detractor say we had to keep petroleum natural gas fuels for power non base uh, power generation. Well, if you eliminate nuclear, you would need carbon-based fuels for baseload. That's true. Uh, which country does the most nuclear fuel come from? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so France does a lot. It, it depends on what you mean in terms of raw materials. Um, I think that India and Australia, and I, I suspect that Australia is the main source, both are rich in uranium. So if we look at the your reserves, uh, and so this will be a useful thing. Oh, that's what I want. I want this list of countries by uranium preserves or uranium reserves. And what do we got? Reserves as of 2015. Australia, Kazakhstan, Canada. Okay, so there you go. Canada has a bunch. Namibia, South Africa, Niger, Russia, China, Brazil. So they all have a few things, but notice that the first three kind of dominate everything. Canada has more than almost the next two combined. Uh, where does it come from? So historical production, this would be where it comes from, which looks like uh, mostly from Canada, the United States, Kazakhstan, Germany, and Australia. So anyways, that's where this is where the reserves are. This is where you get the ore that you then process. If you look at thorium, on the other hand, so if I look at uh, worldwide thorium reserves, there's the moon. So we can always go to the moon and get thorium. Um, oh, okay. I was wrong. India is a thorium source, not a uranium source. So I was I was wrong about that one. Um, the United States for thorium, the United States is uh, second. India, Australia, the United States. So, for the United States, for all of us Americans, this is actually a good thing because it means that our energy supply is not dependent on any other nation. So there's that. That gives you an idea of where the nuclear fuel has come from and where the reserves are worldwide. Now, some of this, there may be quite a bit of unexplored territory in terms of, you know, maybe there's places in the jungles of Asia or Africa or, you know, whatever. There might be other places where you can get some of this stuff that just haven't been explored because um, it hasn't developed to the point where exploration is a, is a feasible thing. All right. Uh, raw material. So mine some New Mexico, uh, Canada, I think we mentioned. Asking, can nuclear power be used for surge uh, additional power to base power? How? Okay, that's a good question. And that is, the question is, not the demand for electricity is not uniform throughout the day. So you have, throughout the day, you've got this changing demand. Um, what is it actually? It actually, so it peaks, peaks in the evening, and it's the lowest right before people wake up. Okay, so this would be like 6 a.m., and then this is about 7 p.m. So this is the shape of the demand curve. And so nuclear energy is not something that you can, that's easily easy to dial up and down. You can do it. You can do it by just inserting the control rods. Um, that takes a bit more active participation in the power generation. So on a nuclear submarine, you would do that. Um, but for the most part, nuclear energy is, you turn it on and then you let it run and you never turn it off. Nuclear energy has the highest, um, what's, what's it called? It's the highest rate of uptime. So for nuclear energy, it's more like, it's something like 90% uptime where it, you turn it on and it's on and one month out of the year, you do some service to it. So, and in some cases it's even better than this, depending on which plant you're talking about. So some plants you're getting like 95% uptime. So it's one month out of every two years where um, you might have to turn the, that station off to do something with it. So uh, nuclear energy is really good for baseload power. There are some applications um, that you can you can imagine taking the heat that comes from the nuclear power station and diverting it to doing something else um, so that you have a baseline power that's up here and then you siphon it off for some other activity when the demand is low and then you um, then you cease doing that activity when the demand uh, starts to rise. And, but that's um, for the most part, nuclear isn't yet to the stage where it's asked to fill in the gaps um, or to fluctuate. Nuclear energy isn't currently asked to fluctuate along with the um, 
the demand curve. One thing that's important to note with electricity is that you have to meet the demand immediately. So when the demand is there, you have the supply also has to be there within basically the light travel time of from the power station to the home that's turning on the electricity. So um, this is something to be aware of when you people want electricity when they want it, and so it has to be supplied when it when it's wanted, and so matching the load to the, the demand to the supply at all times is what utilities are there for. Okay, let's see. So in the United States, they have what are called peaker plants. Um, I'll go and I'll do a stream about the electric grid. Um, the peaker plants deal with the fluctuations that happen throughout the day. Um, they're not as efficient as other things. Let's see. Following your drawing you made earlier, uh, made of working nuclear reactor, what do you do now? What you should do now is you should plug it into the grid. Okay. There is technology of so-called renewable power sources to store surge power, uh, generation carbon blocks with aluminum that absorbs the heat. Um, surge power is taken out by running water through. Yeah, so there are a variety of ways to, uh, to deal with this. We haven't talked about the electrical grid, so I'll save that for a later stream. Um, yes, go ahead and post a relevant link. So that is um, the basic idea of a thorium reactor, like a breeder reactor or a thorium reactor. Um, a few things uh, I'll briefly touch about, uh, touch on in terms of the safety of these reactors. One of the advantages you have, or like the big advantage you have with these molten salt reactors is the safety features. So the way that these things are designed, this might be something that better saved for later. In fact, so I'm gonna hold off on this and I'm not gonna be streaming this coming Thursday, but I will be back on Tuesday. And so that's probably the best thing for me to do is spend more time next time on generation four nuclear reactors and um, talking about how they are, what safety features they have that are different than um, what we currently have with the generation two reactors that we're operating with. So that will be the, that will be a good thing because that'll, that'll take about that amount of time um, next week. So. This week we talked about breeder reactors and the idea behind molten salt thorium reactors. Some of the advantages you get, it's more efficient because you operate at higher temperatures. It's more efficient because you use the fuel more efficiently um, and will deal with safety issues. These are more safe than what's already the safest form of electricity that we uh, generate. And we'll do that in a week from today. So otherwise, does anybody have any last questions? On-site storage of waste will eventually run out of space. What should happen with the waste? Uh, journey started. That's a great question. Um, what do we do with the nuclear waste? So right now in the United States, what we do is we argue about it in the chambers of government. Uh, what we do, what other places in the world are doing, and there's an interview that I had with Richard Muller, and he has a company that he started called Deep Isolation. And this seems like a really promising approach. So deep isolation, what they do is they, let's see if it has the overview. Um, why don't I, I'll just draw a picture of it. So deep isolation, their idea is that you have, here's the surface of the earth, you have groundwater right here, and then you have bedrock that goes way down. So like the core of the earth is down here. The water table is fairly close to the surface. Um, it basically is, the, at the top of the bedrock. The reason we know that the water table, table is close to the surface, or the reason that the typical person would know that the water table is, table is close to the surface, is because you can go and you can dig a well down to it. And so anything where you can lower a bucket on a string and pull it back up with water in it, and that string is not a mile long, um, indicates that it's close to the surface. So the water table is going to be at like, you know, 100 feet or something like that. All right, so one of the dangers of just storing the nuclear waste right here is that if something happens, then the water leaks out and gets into the water table. But once you get deep enough, there's no more water, um, certainly no water that makes it into the ecosystem. And the idea of deep isolation is that they drill down um, and then they use these uh, fairly modern technology, um, as in like the last couple decades of horizontal drilling. So then they drill across and they make a big line. You can make several of these that are kind of right next to each other. So this is going you know, back like this. So you have a bunch of these things. You drill down, a, like this will be a mile underground, and then you have a mile, uh, a mile of horizontal drilling here. And then you take these casks and you just drop them down, send them up here, put it in there, cement them in place. And so you have a series of all of these things. 
that are a mile below the surface. Uh, a mile below the surface is already deeper than Yucca Mountain, for example. Um, and it's way, way below the water table. So there's no chance of the stuff, even if one of these things breaks open, um, it's embedded in bedrock. And so it's going to diffuse. You'll get some diffusion outwards. Um, over the course of a million years, it might diffuse out by a factor of two or something like that. Um, but it's got no way of this material making it up to the surface, um, anything like that. So this is uh, what you do with the solid fuel waste that we have. So in looking with the uranium fuel and stuff like that, this is deep isolation. And this seems like a really promising idea. I believe that they have a pilot study or a contract for something in the Baltic states, um, but I don't know the, the current state of things. But anyways, this seems really promising. It uses a fairly new technology. Um, it's putting it far enough underground. You can go to their website and I think it has all the studies about like here's how the um, here's how neighboring rocks will be activated by the presence of, you know, if some of this stuff starts leaking out. Um, the chances of it leaking are already small. And then if it does leak, the chances of it spreading very far are minuscule. And even if it does spread very far, it's still far away from anything that's going to affect humans. So um, that's pretty cool. All right. Uh, has anyone thought of a better way to convert nuclear power into electricity than boiling water? So that's a great question. The answer to that question is um, not really. So um, this is one of the things that people bring up, and it's a common thing that comes up, is why are we still boiling water? And the answer is it's not so much the heat source that's the issue. Like, So you have a bunch of different technologies to provide the heat source. So this could be a natural gas turbine. It could be... I'm sorry, it could be natural gas, it could be oil, it could be coal, it could be nuclear, whatever it is. But then eventually you have to get a magnet. Here's your magnet with a north and a south pole. And you have to spin this magnet in a coil of wire. That's how you generate electricity. So you're stuck using del cross E equals minus uh, db dt. Um, you're using um, del dot E equals 4 pi rho. You're using del cross B. You're using Maxwell's equations. You can only generate electricity with Maxwell's equations because those are the equations that govern it. And so uh, if we want to live in a world with, you know, in our own universe, we have to use the equations that govern the or that describe the physics of our universe. And that's Maxwell's equations, which means we need to have this in particular. We need to change the magnetic field in something in order to generate an electric field. So we have to have a spinning magnet in a wire. And so you're stuck with some rotation. You have to spin something. And the way that you spin it is you connect it to something that you can get to spin. And so you have a turbine that spins your magnet. Um, okay, so that's your generator. So you have a turbine spinning the generator. So then how do you get the turbine to, to rotate? Well, you could do it with like a water turbine where you just drop water down the hill and you cause it to spin um, the turbine directly and that spins the generator. Or you generate steam and you, draw, you drive steam through the turbine. So you have a, a steam turbine. And so how you generate the steam is the real question. It's not really a question of how, like the spinning the turbine is kind of a fixed thing. Uh, but how, what you use to spin the turbine and how you generate the heat to cause the thing to spin the turbine, those are the, the real crux of the matter. So you can use, steam turbines have been optimized over what, two centuries now. And so if you don't have a better technology, then why change it? Uh, you can also use like gas, like a, another high temperature gas besides steam to drive the turbine if you wanted. Um, but that's really what it, boil, what it boils down to. <laughs> uh, that's really what it comes down to is that um, the heat source is where this discussion is about the heat source rather than what are the mechanical devices that you're using to generate the electricity. The electricity is generated you're stuck using Maxwell's equations um, because there's no new theory about electricity and magnetism that somehow negates Maxwell's equations. Um, and if you want to get something to spin, you have to spin it. So that's where that comes from. It was called, so that company was called Deep Isolation. Deep Isolation. And you can see their logo has um, what their horizontal bore looks like. It talks about the community. So you can see their demonstrations and stuff like that um, as they go through it. All right. 
Thanks again, everybody. I appreciate it very much. So next time we will talk about the designs of these Generation 4 nuclear reactors and in particular the safety. So we'll go through the safety mechanisms that are in place.